Many videos ago, we gave ourselves a very difficult task. We went on a quest to find a multiplication for two-dimensional vectors. We wanted our multiplication to have all of the familiar properties of real number multiplication, such as associativity and commutativity. We tried many different possibilities, and we came to the conclusion that only a single product has all of these properties. That product is complex multiplication. And so we found that the complex numbers are the only two-dimensional number system with a well-behaved multiplication. Today we continue that old quest. We want to find an interesting multiplication for higher dimensional vectors. We will discover that this new product has some unexpected properties and that it brings together many results that used to be scattered across algebra, geometry and even physics. Out of all the requirements we imposed on our product, the most difficult one by far was invertibility. We want each vector v to have an inverse, v to the minus 1, so that when we multiply the two together, we get the neutral element, the real number 1. Even though this is a very tall order, a demand that is very tricky to meet, we will still be able to find a solution, but it will force us to introduce many new objects called multivectors. And we will see that some of those new multivectors are invertible, but many aren't. We can't expect to get everything, but we will get a lot. Why do we so desperately want to be able to invert the product between two vectors? What's so important about that? Well, first of all, our new product will allow us to write many geometric concepts and algorithms in a purely algebraic way. The multivectors in our new algebraic system will play the roles of lines, planes, circles, reflections, rotations, and other geometric objects and transformations. We will see that it can be very useful to divide by a line or by a plane. And I'm sure you can imagine what happens when you invert a rotation or a translation. But there is another incredibly useful thing that we can do with invertible vectors. We can use them to create sandwich products. In a sandwich product, one of the crusts of the sandwich is always the inverse of the other one. So we really do need inverses in order to construct sandwiches. We will see that they play a central role in geometric algebra. You might even say that the sandwich product is the one concept that brings everything together. We will spend a lot more time on it in the rest of the series. Okay, so inverses are important, but that doesn't mean that we necessarily have to invent a brand new product. Why can't we just use one of the products we already know? such as the dot product, or the wedge product, or the cross product. What's wrong with those? The answer is that those products aren't good enough. I can be blunt about the cross product. It sucks. It can only be defined in three dimensions. It isn't even associative. It has none of the properties that we want. Please just forget that it exists we will replace it with a much better alternative in an upcoming video. So this one definitely goes off the list. The dot and wedge products are not invertible. The reason is that they both throw away important information about their input vectors, so that we can't recover the original vectors anymore. You may remember that the dot product is used for projections. And the thing is, when you project one vector onto another, you lose the orthogonal part of your vector. There's now an infinite number of vectors that have the same projection. So you can never invert the projection because you don't know which of these infinitely many points you originally came from. The wedge product has a similar problem. It cannot be inverted either. So we have to conclude that none of the products we have at our disposal will serve our purposes. We have no choice but to invent a new one from scratch. It's called the geometric product, or also sometimes the Clifford product. We write it without a symbol. 
So whenever I place two vectors side by side in an expression, it's always a geometric product. In order to be useful to us, we want our new product to satisfy a list of demands. Apart from the obvious ones, such as associativity and being closed, let's look at some of the other demands in more detail. One extremely important demand is linearity. This means that the product preserves linear combinations. Whenever you replace one of the inputs by a linear combination, you should get the same linear combination of the individual outputs. If you stare at this formula closely, you will see that it's actually a kind of distributivity. This is going to be crucial for everything that follows because it allows us to break a geometric product into smaller pieces. As soon as we have defined pairwise products between all the basis vectors, we can then use linearity to construct all other products for any pair of vectors. So this one is a big deal. Next, we also need a neutral element. It must be the real number 1, so that 1 times a vector always gives you the same vector. Note that what we're doing here is a geometric product between a scalar, the number 1, and a vector. Lucky for us, it turns out that the geometric product between scalars and vectors is exactly the same as good old familiar vector scaling, where we scale a vector by some real factor. We have always been writing this without any symbol between the scalar and the vector, and now we can just keep doing that, so that's nice. We will see how to define the geometric product between many other kinds of objects too. It's very flexible and versatile. It isn't exclusive to vectors. Now that we have a neutral element, we can finally define inverses. Remember from our discussion of groups that the inverse of any object V is defined like this. When you do something and then you undo it, you haven't done anything at all. So now you see why we need a neutral element before we can talk about inverses. Okay, cool. At this point, only one big question remains. How exactly do we satisfy the final demand? How do we construct a product that makes all non-zero vectors invertible? Well, there might be many strategies to make that happen. The strategy we pick in geometric algebra is really simple. We demand that every vector must square to a real number. You will often see this referred to as the contraction axiom, and it's the one decision that sets geometric algebra apart from other systems. In the rest of the series we will see that everything else follows from this simple specific choice. But how exactly does the contraction axiom help us invert vectors? It's honestly incredibly easy. Whenever a vector v squares to a real number r, we simply divide both sides by r, and we get this. We have a vector v, and we have a different vector v over r. Their product is 1, and that's exactly the definition of an inverse. The inverse of v is v over r. That's all there is to it. Now, I have to admit that when I first encountered this, I was a bit underwhelmed. The inverse of any vector is basically the same vector, just rescaled a little bit. This means that the inverse stays on the same line as the original. It doesn't even manage to interact with the rest of the space. At first blush, that seems pretty lame. But then I thought about it some more and I realized that this behavior of inverses is actually very familiar. It's exactly how real numbers work. They also stay on a line, the real number line. The inverse of 3 is 1 over 3. If you now think of the number 3 as a one-dimensional vector that starts at the origin and runs 3 units to the right, its inverse is the same vector, but scaled down by a factor of 9. So you basically obtain the inverse of any vector or real number by first scaling it down by its own length, which turns it into a unit vector, 
and then scaling down by that same length a second time to get the final result. This means that the number r is really the squared length of the vector. So you will often see the contraction axiom written like this. Each vector must square to the square of its own length. So upon closer inspection, vector inverses actually make a lot of sense. In fact, the way I like to think of it is that every line in our vector space is now a kind of real number line. Well, at least if it runs through the origin. The vectors on the line behave exactly like the real numbers. And our new product behaves exactly like real number multiplication. Nothing could be easier. There are a few more things that I have to say about this. First off, the fact that the real numbers are living on every single line through the origin is just one of many examples of traditional number systems being embedded inside geometric algebra. We will see a few more cases later. Also, be mindful of the fact that we never said that the real number r must be positive. Some extensions of geometric algebra have vectors that square to negative numbers. And of course, those numbers cannot be interpreted as squared lengths at all. So, the analogy with real numbers only takes us so far. I also want to stress that even though all non-zero vectors are now invertible, this is definitely not true for the other objects we will encounter, the so-called multivectors. Some of them may be invertible, but most of them won't be. So, we will end up with an algebra full of objects, and only a small subset of them will have inverses. This is simply because finding an invertible product is extremely difficult, as we already experienced in the series on complex numbers. But hey, at least vectors always have inverses. And that's already a good deal. Finally, I have to warn you that our new product is not commutative. Commutativity was not on our list of requirements. In general, when you swap the two inputs of the product, you will get a totally different output. As a consequence, even if an object is invertible, its left inverse might be different from its right inverse. That's why in geometric algebra we should avoid writing division using the traditional slash or fraction line. It's better to explicitly multiply with the inverse, so that we can clearly distinguish between multiplying on the left or on the right. Lucky for us, the left and right inverses for vectors are always the same. In the next video, we will find a formula for our new product, so that we can start calculating its value for any two multivectors. We will start to get interesting hints of other number systems hiding inside geometric algebra. I can't wait to show you how that works, because our new product is full of surprises. You will see. Meanwhile, don't forget to subscribe and like, and support us on Patreon if you want to watch the rest of the series right now, or if you want to see exclusive content. Thank you.